Hello everyone, welcome to the latest in our series of videos where we ask the expert. Today I'm joined by uh, Peter Swift of Amphenol, uh, and we are going to be specifically talking about the, the Amphenol communications solutions, and we're going to be talking about the industrial Ethernet. Now, Ethernet, I think, is something that most of us are aware of, most of us are very familiar with, to the point where it's, it's almost just the power in the walls. It's so familiar, but there are lots of things that are going on in the world of industrial Ethernet that are very exciting, that are all tied up with things like the smart factory, the Internet of Things, and the connectivity that goes along with that is, is vitally important. So um, I'd like to welcome Peter. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm going to launch in with the first question and, and address what I've just talked about, which is that, that Ethernet is something that a lot of us are familiar with uh, in the office, maybe even at home. Um, but how is it being used in the industrial space? Sure. It's a great question and, and a great way to start, David. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'll start off by saying that Ethernet is used in a really wide variety of uh, industries and markets, you know, all the way from um, uh, service providers, cloud providers, um, enterprise solutions, you know, or networks in our homes, even automotive and industrial now as well. Um, essentially, Ethernet is the same thing for all of those, but they all have their own unique challenges and ways that they need to be implemented. Um, you know, in an office environment, of course, as you just alluded to, Ethernet's sort of in the walls and we just plug into it and it's got your modular jacks and you're hooking together computers and, and peripherals like printers and things like that and communicating with servers and, and with the Internet. And that's typically an office environment where it is, you know, protected and, and you don't need any fancy ruggedized connection systems. In fact, sort of the, you know, the, the cheaper, the better in, in cases like that for economy of scale. Um, in an industrial environment, what we're talking about is a control system that is uh, controlling all the equipment in the factory and talking to the control systems, you know, at the various different levels within within the architecture of the system. So uh, uh, in, inherently, uh, an industrial environment can require um, some ruggedized types of solutions because it can be a harsh environment. It could be high temperatures. It can be subject to, you know, impact shock, vibration, even water spray, things like that. So you need connectors and things that are going to provide that level of protection as well as the reliability and, um, you know, the integrity of the system because it, obviously you don't want your system going down at all. Um, but, but again, between an office environment and industrial, it, it's really the same or conceptually, it's the same thing. It's just that your peripherals in a factory environment are going to be things like sensors, actuators, um, you know, machinery, equipment, and things that all have to work in perfect unison and synchronicity to to work properly. Um, and in an industrial environment, there are protocols needed that uh, really work in real time, and there, there can't be any lag and um, uh, it's called determinism and real-time control. So Ethernet provides that, um, you know, control for time-sensitive actions. Time-sensitive actions can be things like sending a signal to an actuator, receiving information back from a sensor, processing, processing that information, and then telling the equipment what to do. Ethernet has a big advantage in that um, it's already set up to do all that kind of communication very, very effectively. And, you know, some of the existing systems uh, in more traditional factories have established protocols that are used in different levels of the factory, but they don't necessarily talk well to each other. So Ethernet has the capability of joining all of that together. Um, and the fact that, you know, there are things like programmable logic controllers and, you um, uh, other pieces of equipment that need to talk to each other in these control cabinets within a factory um, means that Ethernet is a, is a perfect protocol to allow those things to all talk to, together really effectively, really effectively talk to the upper levels of management and control within the factory and, you know, also right down to the sensor and the actuator level, which we re really refer to as sort of the uh, uh, the floor level, of, if you will. So you've used the word level there. I think it might be worth us having a, just a quick look. Um, so we're talking about in a factory, it's not just a, a single set of cables like you'd find in an office. 
you, you've mentioned levels within a factory. So what does a, what does a factory look like in terms of these different levels? What do they do? Sure. So um, the, the, the sort of traditional architectural models look like a, a variety of levels, as you said, all the way from the sensor level at the bottom, which is what I was referring to, right up to the enterprise level up at the top. And this would be the level where you've got all your business planning and logistics and actually connections to the cloud. Um, and so working down from the top, you've got your enterprise level, then you go to your factory level, which is where you have your operations management. Uh, then to your control level, which is where you've got some of the supervisory process control uh, functions happening. And then you're getting down more into the, you know, the working section of the factory. Next, then you get into the device level. So this has got things like programmable logic controllers, CNC equipment, things like that. And then the level below that, the bottom level really is your sensor level. And this, again, is where you've got things like uh, sensors, actuators, um, uh, transmitters, and other pieces of, of discrete equipment that do a specific function like valves, pumps, motors, relays, things like that. So those are the things that would then have to communicate to all of these control systems up above, and they all need to communicate with each other in, in, in a very controlled fashion. So that's given us an idea of, of the, the, the shape and the functions of different parts mm -hmm. of the factory. Uh, and let's dive in, because we're going to talk about connectors. So let's dive in and talk about the connectors themselves. So, so there's a there's a network connector with which I think most of us are familiar, the RJ, the RJ45, the, the modular mm -hmm. jack, however it's it's referred to. So the little clear plastic connector that's, I don't know, half an inch across. Mm -hmm. That's what we're familiar with. It that has a role in these levels, doesn't it? Absolutely it does. Um to talk about RJs for just a second. Um you mentioned this little clear plastic connector, and that's how they started out, absolutely. Sort of back in the mid-70s, these were developed for telephones, modular telephones. And it proved to be such um, uh, an inexpensive, uh, reliable, easy-to-use type of a connector that it started getting adopted in a lot of different industries. So now if you look around, you're going to see these virtually everywhere and all sorts of shapes and sizes, but they all still have that one little interface you know it's the same size and shape and everything but you're going to see a lot of different housings and things that they would go into um, there's been a lot of work done to increase their uh, ruggedness and durability um, uh, you know protective um, aspects of it uh, speeds things like that so i mean you, you've taken this um, really great little connector and really expanded its use right across all, all industries and markets. The problem is it's got some limitations, some inherent limitations. Um, as you mentioned, you know, initially it's this little plastic connector. That's, you know, the plug itself typically is a plastic housing with a series of contacts that are terminated to the wires um, using what we call insulation displacement. And it's these contacts are, when, when the wires are inserted, the contacts are pushed into place, pierce the insulation and make the connection. And that's fantastic for a really cheap, easy, you know, widely used connector. And there's, you know, thousands of suppliers of these things around the world. However, it, that is um, a design that has some inherent weaknesses and flaws in, you know, the little plastic latch on there. I think everybody is familiar with these in cases where they've broken off, you know, you pull hard enough on it in a jack and it's going to rip out of there and, and the, and the, the, you know, the, the tab is going to break off. So there have been industrial versions of these created where you've got, you know, metal latches and things like that, but you're still going to have a lot of um, some inherent sort of brick walls you're going to run into using an RJ connector. Number one is size. Um, it, you can only get so small. And while there are some unique um, ways that have, have been used to reduce the size of an RJ, all you can really do is reduce the outer dimensions of it. This, the, the plug part of it has to stay the same size. So that's going to be a limit to, to you. Um, you've got the plastic latches, uh, which, which make it, you know, not a very strong connector in some regards. And then you've got the layout of the contacts in it, which while they're fine for sort of analog signals, um, and even for some kind of low speed, um, you know, paired wires where you've got, um, you know, signals running through them, digital signals, they weren't really designed as a digital signal connector. And as you get up into the higher speeds, um, 
you've got to do some fancy things in the connector. You've got to add compensation into it. You've got to do things to um, uh, allow for the signal integrity, essentially. And that has upper limits as well. And while there have been some, some you know, clever things that have been done, they're, they're kind of at the limit of what they can do. Um, now, as we progress from the RJ connector, that has led us to the need for other types of solutions. And within industrial Ethernet and within factories, there have been a lot of different types of solutions. A lot of circular connectors are used. I think people are probably familiar with something called an M12 connector. There's a whole variety and configurations of those. There are other larger uh, mechanically rugged circular connectors that have, you know, these big coupling rings on them. And there's a whole variety of other types of rectangular connectors that range from, you know, smaller smaller devices up to huge sort of modular connectors that people can put arrays of power contacts and signal contacts in and everything. But a lot of those are very sort of customized for their own unique applications. So there, there's a wide range of connectors that are, that are used out there, and they're all great for their own specific purposes they've been designed for. But there is a need for something that is going to become a more ubiquitous type of an interface like an RJ, but surpasses those limitations that an RJ inherently has. And that kind of is what has led to the development of some of these uh, newer uh, industrial Ethernet interfaces. So, yes, the performance is, is clearly one of the key drivers. We were talking about data speeds and, and the fact that the RJ is designed for for low speed analog signals and, and mm -hmm. at the lower end of the digital transmissions that, that we were used to. Mm -hmm. But now, of course, with the internet of things, with things like 5G communications, everybody is expecting higher speed, higher performance. And so I guess that's, that's one of the reasons why we're, we're gonna start looking at some of these new solutions. So, so I know that there's at least a couple of new solutions that are, have come along that uh, might not necessarily replace RJ, but certainly they take that technology and, and develop it. So what is it that Amphenol has been working on in terms of these new Ethernet connectors for the industrial space? Great, uh, great question, thank you. Um, so there, there's a couple of, of interfaces that we have um, introduced over the last year or so. Uh, the first one is called IX Industrial, um, and the other one is called Single Pair Ethernet. So they go kind of hand in glove, and I'll, I'll explain uh, explain how that works. The IX industrial connector is meant to be a sort of ruggedized, industrialized version of what an RJ is doing in, in that kind of an application. Um, as I mentioned, an RJ has sort of size limitations. And IX, I'll just refer to it as IX, the IX connector um, has, has taken that concept and reduced it in size so that it's essentially about a quarter to a third of the size of an RJ, depending on the RJ you're connecting it to. So it's got tremendous space savings. Um, and it's also been designed from the ground up to be a rugged connector used for industrial applications. So it's got an all metal housing. Um, the, the plug is all metal as well in, you know, contrast to an RJ connector that's typically uh, plastic. And although they can have metal shield around them, um, Again, it, it's something of a compromise. The IX connector has a, you know, is fully shielded on the receptacle and on the plug side. And there is a two point metal latch that's designed into an IX connector. So it latches on both sides of the connector. And these are easily, easily uh, accessed and, and activated by uh, your, your thumb and your forefinger when you're um, mating the connector and, and unmating it. And it provides a very, very strong, reliable connection uh, on both sides of the connector. So it's a lot um, less uh, impacted by shock vibration, you know, accidental pullout forces, that kind of thing, compared to, to an RJ connector. Um, it's also been designed from a signal integrity perspective to specifically for Ethernet applications. So whereas an RJ connector has um, typically eight or 10 contacts that are laid out in a line, the pairs, the way they're lined up, are not symmetrical in an RJ. So you've got these different contact lengths. You've, you're trying to do things to, to minimize crosstalk between pairs, that kind of thing. Whereas with an IX connector, it's been laid out with the pairs very, very symmetrically in the connector uh, in two rows of five contacts. And and it makes all of the pairs virtually identical from an electrical perspective. So 
again, it's been designed from the ground up specifically for um, high-speed twisted pair digital signal applications like like Ethernet. Um, and it's it's been designed with uh, uh, you know a couple of different right angle configurations for a PCB, a vertical configuration as well, and then the plug will um, mate to these all of these different configurations. Plus, um, what's also been designed into the IX connector is um, uh, uh, keying, so that you you can have you know different plugs that will only plug into one one specific key configuration of a receptacle. And that, that provides more flexibility for uh, a customer in, in when they're laying out um, their panel and what they need to be connected where and providing the sort of the fail safes so that you don't plug something in where it shouldn't go. From, from, and again, from a size perspective, what this means is that while a, a typical RJ connector allows you to fit a connector about every, you know, 20 millimeters or so. So you would have a 20 millimeter pitch between connectors. The IX connector is half of that. So it's a 10 millimeter pitch when you've got the flag uh, right angle style mounted on a panel. Essentially, you can double the port density of your panel. So if you've got something like an Ethernet switch, you can fit twice as many channels on it. Or for the same number of channels, you can make it half the size or even smaller than what you would be using with a with a, an RJ connector. And then the other one was single pair Ethernet. And this is intended to work hand in glove with the uh, uh, IX connector. It's still Ethernet protocol, but it's only as you know, the name implies, it's only two wires. So it's really meant to take signals right out to the, the, the device level. So this is going to go to the individual sensors, actuators, things like that, that are an individual addressed device on the network for, for control. So the single pair Ethernet doesn't have any sort of extraneous um, signal capability that would be required by something like IX, where you've got a whole lot of signals flowing through it to a whole bunch of different devices. This, the single pair Ethernet is dedicated to a specific device. And so it that gives it the opportunity to be really pared down from a design perspective. And at the same time, it's all those design principles I mentioned for the IX have been incorporated into the single pair Ethernet. So it's got, you know, all metal housings. It's fully shielded through the metal pair, uh, through the mated pair, I should say. Um, the uh, the termination method inside ensures that you can maintain the twist right up to the, the, the termination point inside the connector for signal integrity. Um, and it's it's a rugged connector that's intended to be used in a factory environment. So these two connectors really are, as you said, are not really going to replace every single application of an RJ, but it does extend um, uh, where you might otherwise want to try and use an RJ, it gives you a lot more capability. And it's going to replace RJs in certain situations, absolutely. I want to also pick up on, on that comment you made about the fact that single-pair Ethernet is allowing the individual sensors or the individual activators at the very bottom level of the factory mm. to be part of the same network as the, the business planning layer at the very top, the enterprise layer, because that's that's right. something that I think on Design Spark we, we've certainly we've talked about in the past about the fact mm -hmm. that 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 last was it the last meter they talk about the the last yeah. little link to the devices on the factory floor traditionally have used a completely different networking protocol, which right. means that you then have to translate at some point from the sensors and the actuators up to the Ethernet network. But, Absolutely, but this changes that, doesn't it? It brings Ethernet all the way down to the devices. It does, and that's one of the huge advantages of, of, of using Ethernet in a factory environment. As you said, there are a number of different protocols that can be used specifically at the sensor level and at the device level. And while they're very effective at allowing, you know, good communications, very, very specifically designed communications within each of those layers, they haven't really been designed to easily talk to each other between layers. So... Typically, these have to go through what are called protocol conversion devices. So, you, you could have a you know a box basically that's accepting signals from one layer and accepting signals from another layer and allowing them to talk to each other. That while it's a, it's um, you know a solution that has worked in the past as um, uh, speeds and um, you know the automation process has has advanced and and accelerated in these applications. They, 
really, you really need to try to eliminate any kind of roadblocks and all that communication. And um, that real-time communication can be affected by having to go through these, these protocol conversions. So you don't get uh, any signal lag, essentially. So as you said, you know, Ethernet from top to bottom really allows what we call cloud to sensor direct communication addressable all in the same network. And of, and of course, there's, you know, other uh, uh, factors and, and, and features built into Ethernet that would mean that that would protect one layer from another if if necessary for reasons of security. Um, but it, but again, that's all something that you can program in, and it's not a limitation that's imposed by protocol conversions that would normally be required. And the other thing that that, that brings for us, I'm assuming, is when we want to add additional devices into the network, it is as easy as plugging them in because they're all part of the same Ethernet network. Does that yep. make expansion and installation that much easier? Absolutely. Yes, for sure. Um, you're, you're right in that basically having an Ethernet system top to bottom is going to allow you to basically add devices as necessary and, and address them in, a, in an appropriate fashion. As this develops and this sort of conversion, if you if, if you will, from a more traditional factory to a completely Ethernet controlled factory evolves and develops, we expect that there to, to be some uh, sort of different phases of adaption, uh, adoption, I should say. The, the first phase is what's been referred to as addition. So you would have an established factory environment. Now you're introducing a new piece of equipment or sensor or something like that that needs to work with all that existing equipment. So it, it's, it's very easy if you're using uh, some kind of an adapter cable or something like that to connect as long as the protocols will, will talk to each other. Um, a sensor or a device of, or something like that into the system and do that at different points in your factory without having to change everything. So you can, you can add them in um, as, as needed. And, and then sort of the next stage is what's referred to as migration, where as a factory is undergoing further development, you might add in a whole area or a whole section that is now dedicated to using the, the Ethernet protocol and the various different interconnects that would be required for that. So you're going to start seeing sections of factories being replaced, or if you're putting a new system in, it will use this newer technology. And then the final phase really is going to be referred to as integration, where, you know, it could be a factory that is now being completely restructured on the inside and uh, all of the equipment being replaced or large portions of it, and you will adopt this new technology. So it will actually be top to bottom using this, this industrial Ethernet and all the interconnect that go along with that. Or it could be greenfield applications where you are building a factory from the bottom up and it's all designed that way. So we expect that there are going to be applications and opportunities for, for all of these different stages and probably mixes and, and you know, in between stages as well. Um, but bottom line, I think, is that there's going to be um, greater adoption of IX and, and single pair Ethernet as time progresses and they become more and more popular and, and integrated into factories. But at the same time, I'm guessing it, because they are because they're so flexible, because people can add individual devices or, or maybe even a cluster of individual devices using this technology, you, you've removed one of the big barriers to adoption of new systems, which is which is cost. The, the thought of having to rip out an existing factory completely and start all over again would probably send your facilities manager in, into a, a tailspin. But they don't need to do that, do they? No, that's absolutely right, and and they they probably wouldn't do it if if they if they had to. Um, so one of the advantages of single pair Ethernet and IX is it can use all of your existing infrastructure and cabling. All you're really doing is terminating a new mating interface to the end of that cable. Um, and if, if you are adding new cable in, especially for single pair Ethernet, it offers some advantages in that with only two wires. Um, it's a lower cost cable. It's going to be smaller, more flexible. It can go longer distances. Single pair Ethernet cable uh, is rated to be used up to one kilometer. So if you've got a large factory and you've got a device way over there you have to connect to, you can do that with single pair Ethernet. Um, 
But again, if you've already got some existing cabling and infrastructure running over there, there's no reason why you can't use these new interfaces with that existing infrastructure cabling. And that's interesting and exciting, isn't it? Because I, to begin with, we think about just the connector interface being the bit that's different and the bit that brings yeah. us the advantage. But as you say, if we were talking about reducing fewer, uh, reducing the number of cables we need or using thinner cables and the, the ease with which they're going to be installed, all of a sudden, just changing the connector interface has big knock-on effects in terms of ease of installation and cost savings and so forth further into the, into the factory. Absolutely, yes. And um, the IX connector and the single-pair Ethernet connector are, are very, very cost-effective applications in and of themselves. Uh, I mean, they're comparable to the cost of a, of a modular jack. And in, and in some cases, um, because a high-speed modular jack requires additional you know, compensation built into it with, um, you know, circuit boards and things like that, the IX can actually be more cost effective than, than an RJ connector and then single pair Ethernet e even more so. So there are some inherent cost advantages absolutely with going with these uh, uh, new interconnect systems. Um, so that shouldn't really be a barrier to entry. I, I think the biggest barrier really is going to be uh, people being convinced, if you will, that these connectors will do the job that they need them to do. Um, and then the other barrier, of course, is all the installed infrastructure using RJ technology. That, that's why it's going to take a little bit of time to be adopted. Um, but we are seeing that happening now with a lot of the, uh, the major industrial players that are our, our direct customers. Um, so it, it, it's very, very encouraging, and it absolutely does offer a huge cost advantage going not only with the connectors, but with the cabling, as you mentioned. And the fact that you've got this ubiquitous interface that's used everywhere. Now, you've got economy of scale as well, as opposed to using all these different interfaces. And in terms of persuading customers that, that it can do the job, let's just touch on performance and in terms of data speed, because obviously mm -hmm. that's that's a key consideration nowadays. Everybody, as we said earlier, wants things to be faster. Yes. So these new connectors are designed very much for those high-speed communications, aren't they? Absolutely, yes. The the uh, IX connector is designed, as I said, from the ground up as a CAT 6A level of performance, and there are you know, roadmap plans for it to go beyond that as, as the needs, um, uh, arise. Um, if you take a look at the, you know, performance data curves on these connectors, they're going to provide more, uh, headroom and, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they provide more opportunity for it or uh, additional higher levels of performance than an RJ typically would. With an RJ, you, you need to, as I said, do a lot of things inside that to just get to the point where you're, you're meeting all of those crosstalk and uh, insertion loss curves, et cetera. The, the sync, the, uh, the IX connector it exceeds all of those inherently in its design. So it's got more headroom and more, more ability to advance in terms of the, of the signal. So we're talking about 10 gigabit signals. Um, single pair Ethernet is, um, a lower speed device, but it doesn't need to have that 10 gigabit level of performance because it's, as I mentioned, it's dedicated to a specific device, you know, a sensor or an actuator or whatever, and it doesn't have to multiplex a lot of signals. It, it just has to communicate with that one device. So it's very effective at doing that. And in shorter lengths, it will function up to one gigabit per second. Um, and at the really long lengths of the one kilometer that I mentioned, it will function to um, uh, 10 base T levels of performance. But a big advantage there as well is that it uses uh, heavier cabling. So a single pair Ethernet connector can be terminated uh, with 18 gauge wire. So that means you can have a higher current level, which means you've got less voltage drop over, over a length. So you've got less um, signal uh, degradation, if you will, from one end to the other. Um, and, and that brings me actually to something else maybe you'd like to talk about, which is the uh, uh, power handling capability of these connectors. Um, well, certainly, uh, power over Ethernet is something that, that again yeah. we've heard about, and and the RJ connector has been developed to to provide that solution. So, how is IX and uh, how are IX and SPE providing that kind of that functionality? Well, um, power over Ethernet uh, requires basically contacts to to handle an amount of current so that they can provide up to a hundred watts of of power. Um, and 
f- frankly, while an RJ connector is capable of doing that, the IX connector can 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 almost double that. I mean, because of the signal handling and the and the current handling capability of these of these contacts, um, they'll easily perform to the um, 802.3 uh, level of PoE plus plus, if you will, um, to provide that 100 watts of power. But that leaves a lot of headroom in terms of the current handling capability of the contacts. And so it can go beyond that uh, if necessary. With RJ, you'd be, you could as well, but you'd be pushing it a little bit. With single pair Ethernet, um, it's the same kind of thing, but it's referred to as Poodle or power over the data line. And that provides, it's specified to provide 50 watts of power, but with the, with the power handling capability of the single pair Ethernet connector uh, being up to between four and five amps per contact, you can actually greatly exceed that. So the whole advantage of power over Ethernet and Poodle, of course, is to eliminate or greatly reduce the need for any other kind of distributed power out to all these different devices and their power directly from the data line. So it, incre- uh, you know, it reduces the cost uh, and it highly increases the flexibility of the devices and where they can go and how many you can have and all, all that kind of thing. It just makes it a much more effective way of delivering power to these devices. Uh, we, we talked to somebody recently and we were talking about the, the number of sensors that you find on the average industrial machine on the factory floor. And it's, it's getting towards hundreds, if not you know, over that. And the ability to, to deploy these sensors without having to power them locally at the same time is going to be an enormous advantage. A- absolutely. 100% agree. Um, you, you can completely eliminate that additional infrastructure of power delivery, if you will. Um and if you think of a you know, factory almost as an organism, you know, you've, you've uh, like a, like a human body perhaps where you've got all of these, you know, cells doing their own, their function. Think of the sensors and the actuators that way as well. Uh, you, you've got to have this, there's this proliferation of, of devices and th- the more granular their function becomes, the way they function together as, as a unit means that that the number of them is going to greatly increase the reliability has to be there but you also have to make sure that they can be powered you know, it, separately basically from the data line and and don't require all kinds of heavy cables and things coming in because that just kind of defeats the purpose and 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 uh, eliminates the or prevents you from achieving those levels of density that you'd otherwise achieve peter thank you so much for your help and your time been my pleasure, uh, David. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, it was very enjoyable talking to you. I, I, I appreciate it very much. 